market by according to EU policies, um, I think has a clear right uh, to be treated in the same way. If you recall the original interest reduction in the interest rates on loans, it occurred because of a decision taken in relation to the Greek situation. The current alleviation of debt in terms of Portugal and Ireland is welcome, but again it follows the Portuguese initiative on the basis of what happened in Greece. And I asked you about this last week, Taoiseach, in terms of the uh, will the ECB, or have you um, asked the ECB, have you formally asked for the ECB profits uh, on Irish bonds to be returned to Ireland or not? Now, you, you, you weren't in a position to answer the question last week. You said you would seek information from Minister Noonan and then inform the, the House of the result. So I'm asking you again, have you formally asked for the ECB profits on Irish bonds to be returned to Ireland or not? And the second point I would like to make to you is, in relation to the United Kingdom and Prime Minister Cameron's position in terms of a possible exit of his country from the Union, um, you declined to say anything uh, other than that we didn't really want this to happen and that it would be bad for Ireland. I think we know we do not necessarily want it to happen here. We know it would be bad for Ireland. But what I'd like to ask you, Taoiseach, is whether we're going to do anything to either stop it or prevent it from occurring or given that we're looking at the potential exit of, of the largest um, trading partner within the EU, from the EU, have we commissioned any studies um, beyond the general to the specific in terms of the impact of such a decision if the UK was to proceed along that path? To stopping a potential referendum? No, quantifying the impact of a British exit on the Irish economy. Have we commissioned any study in relation to what the actual impact would be on the Irish economy? Let me say in respect of the ECB, first of all, Deputy Martin, that the Governing Council of the European Central Bank decided on the 21st of uh, February to publish the Eurosystem's holdings of securities acquired under the Securities Markets Programme, or what is called the SMP, and that decision is in line with the envisaged transparency stance for the outright monetary transactions, as was communicated on the 6th of September last year, at which time the uh, Securities Markets Programme was terminated. That showed total holdings at the 31st of December 2012 with a nominal value of 218 billion comprised of Italian, Greek, Spanish, Portuguese and Irish bonds. Of this total, I Irish bonds amounted to 14.2 billion nominal value with an average remaining maturity of 4.6 years. The statement did not include any estimate of any profit which the ECB may or may not realise on such bonds. However, the ECB also released its annual accounts on the 21st of February, and the press release accompanied that showed that the ECB's total interest earnings on a securities market programme and their holdings of Irish, Greek, Spanish, Italian and Portuguese bonds in 2012 was 1.1 billion. The statement confirmed that some 555 million euro of this interest arose from its holdings on Greek bonds which amounted to 33.9 uh, billion euro. The remaining 463 million of the ECB's SMP interest earnings arose from its combined holdings of Italian, Spanish, Portuguese and Irish bonds. I think we should be cognizant of the fact that the ES ECB is bound by its obligations under the EU treaties and that member states must respect that for the ECB. Um, the package of measures that was agreed for Greece on November the 26th by Eurozone finance ministers was designed to put the uh, Greek economy on a path to sustainable growth and its domestic finances on a sound footing. That package was agreed in the context of the statement by the Euro area heads of state or government that the scale of the Greek problem was so large that it required special attention. It's important to note that the concessions that were agreed are specifically to Greece and were accompanied by significant additional uh, conditionality. One of the measures that was proposed for the Deputy's information in November, uh, the SMP profits measure, will see member states pass on to Greece's segregated account an amount equivalent to the income on the SMP portfolio that would eventually accrue to their national central banks as from budget year 2013. Member states under a full financial assistance programme such as Ireland are not required to participate in this scheme for the period in which they receive financial assistance. So Ireland obviously is in a very different position to Greece. Our programme is working 
We have completed 190 agreed targets. We've surpassed many, including our annual uh, deficit targets. Growth has returned to the economy, and I welcome last week's figures showing positive employment growth. And furthermore, as a country exiting a program, our situation cannot be seen as comparable to Greece. We uh, continue to examine the Greek package to see if any aspects of it offer any possible benefit uh, to Ireland, particularly in regard to our exit. So I think we should remind deputies that um, the EU finance ministers agreed in January that the request made by Portugal and Ireland for an extension of the maturities of their loans from the EFSF and the EFSM would be considered by senior officials before coming back to finance ministers for further consideration. Um, finally, as people will be aware, we've had some positive news recently. The elimination of the promissory notes in IBRC, the sale of the Bank of Ireland Cocos, the recent sale of Irish Life, and just this week the announcement of the ending of the bank guarantee are significant milestones on this country's way back to recovery. We still obviously have very important and necessary decisions to take, as evidenced by the recent agreement on public sector pay, but Ireland is a country continuing to restore the damage done and returning to more normal circumstances, albeit not without risks along the way. Um, I think I should say that I would recall the benefits that we've received already, notably assistance in the form of the reduction of interest rates and extended maturities. In addition, the heads of uh, state and government last June agreed on breaking the link between banks and sovereign, and they made explicit reference to Ireland in that uh, decision. It's important to remember that Ireland is exiting a programme. We should have regard to what we need to assist uh, that exit rather than focus solely on, on measures that are provided from a for a country in very different circumstances than ours. Now, as uh, deputies aware, the um, ECOFIN group under the chairmanship of the Minister for Finance have been discussing uh, this matter today. And while the situation has been agreed in principle, um, clearly uh, the Troika need to analyse the details of that and if it's agreed, um, uh, obviously it has to be put to each country. But in, 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 the, in the context of extending the maturities of the loans given to both Portugal and Ireland, this would be of uh, further significant benefit to us as we, as we uh, make our way to exiting this programme, both in terms of the, of the fact that these are monies from European institutions uh, at lower interest rates than we could uh, achieve on the, uh, on the markets now and therefore um, a longer extension of that would be a benefit to us. Um, but uh, as I said, it's too early to make a, make a, uh, a definitive uh, statement about it until these things are finished. Um, in regard to, uh, have we done an analysis on the impact of, um, on the, impact of the potential exit, uh, were that to be decided by the British government and the British people in the European Union? I've already said that this would be of the more serious import uh, in terms of this country and indeed in the context of the European Union. Um, I uh, expect to devote some of our conversation time next week to this matter when I meet with the um, with Prime Minister in, um, in London. Clearly, um, Britain being Ireland's closest neighbour, being our biggest trading partner, being uh, so close in so many other respects, uh, I wouldn't like to see a situation where Britain uh, decided to leave the European Union. Uh, clearly, being a founder member of the single market in the context of discussions that will take place under the Irish presidency uh, on trade issues with, uh, with Japan and Singapore and Canada uh, and other countries, and also the hopefully that we get a mandate to start the negotiations on EU-US trade talks once Ireland's um, presidency is finished. If we get the mandate during our presidency, the talks would commence uh, subsequent to Ireland's presidency. But the figures there, Deputy Martin, indicate um, the possibility of the creation of at least two million jobs in the European scale with the opportunity to increase um, economic growth in, in, um, in the different countries by up to 3%. Um, so these are, these are issues that I intend to discuss with um, uh, Prime Minister Cameron. But we haven't carried out an analysis on the impact of it. But clearly, uh, from our point of view, having voted 60-40 in favour of the Fiscal Stability Treaty the euro and the eurozone. We also want to keep both our ports and gates uh, of business open uh, to and from Britain in a very real way, um, and that would be that would be of you know um, so so fundamental and importance for us here and for them because of their exports to Ireland 
and vice versa. So that's an issue I'll discuss with him next week when I meet. Deputy Higgins, I come back to you. Thank you, um, Tisha, can I ask you what role do you play in relation to your um, contact and discussions with the EU leaders on the issue of Ireland's debts, um, as distinct or in complement to the finance ministers? Uh, just now and again this morning, uh, you trumpeted as a great breakthrough the fact that the repayment of the bank debts to the Troika and, and to the various uh, programmes being uh, drawn out over a further period of perhaps 15 years. You trumpeted that as a great success. Um, can I ask you if you will explain that to the Irish people, that instead of telling the Troika that the debt that they insisted that was put on the shoulders of the Irish people to salvage their financial system, that it was unsustainable to continue to pay this debt with the savage austerity that you impose on our people, you turn around and extend the time so that it becomes like a war reparation situation. And not just the present generation, but generations yet unborn will be carrying the debt. So can you justify this, uh, uh, please? And can I ask you in that regard, just with rega in regard to the promissory notes and the changes uh, that were made there, we never heard what the total cost will be to the Irish people over the 40 years or so that this is going to spin out. Equally, can you tell me what is the implications cost-wise for what was announced this morning? Uh, um, in, in regard to the total bill that our people will pay, whether it's over 12 years, 10 years, or, or, or a further 15 years added on to that. Secondly, Tishak, for the EU presidency, I, I read that your deputy and Tarnished Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Deputy Gilmore, has stored a virtual lake of Lynch Bage, a fine French wine at 80, 80 euro a bottle. Now, the elite of Europe coming here to drink that fine wine are the ones demanding savage austerity on the Irish people. It wouldn't it be more appropriate to serve them perhaps chilled buttermilk uh, instead of uh, fine, expensive wine, which is a further burden on the Irish people? and make them practice what they preach a little. Thank you. Tisha. Well, I can, I can assure you that at the working lunch I had the other, the other day with um, the Swedish Prime Minister and with the, um, with the Norwegian Prime Minister, it was um, cool, clear water that was on offer. But I think it's uh, appropriate that the, uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, should, have, uh, should have some, uh, some refreshment available for international visitors of, um, of, um, uh, well, of, of, of connection with our country here. Uh, I don't think that even you, from your socialist perspective, would begrudge the, 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 um, the grape pickers in the vineyards in socialist areas the right to produce fine wine uh, and to, uh, to be able to sell it in respect of boosting their own economies. I know you'd never begrudge them a sip of red or white, as the case might be. Uh, let me assure you that the government and the Minister and Thornish uh, for Foreign Affairs uh, are very conscious of the requirement to be realistic in expenditure these days, much, uh, much more uh, so than, than what happened in the past. You ask me, what is the role of the... Um, leaders in respect of our debt. Well, you're aware of the process. You're out there yourself in the parliament. You know what it's like. Um, and these things go through a process until they come to the heads of state and government uh, eventually for decision. Uh, in between, it may be necessary to have contact on an occasional basis or on a bilateral basis with individual leaders from other countries. But for instance, the case has to be put by the individual leader or head of government uh, at the council meeting uh, in order to have 
uh, something either adapted unanimously or agreed in whatever form. And that's what happened, let's say, in the, in the case of the uh, decision of the 29th of June last, where all the preparatory work that had been gone through by the, uh, by the prominent reps, by the uh, public officials, uh, come through the process of, of um, ministers of finance, but be agreed by, uh, be agreed by leaders. I didn't describe this as a great breakthrough this morning. What I did say was that it would be of uh, considerable benefit to the country were it to be agreed. Um, and I can't foresee the, uh, the conclusion of the, uh, of the discussions that will take place. As I said, Commissioner Wren uh, said this morning, were this to be agreed, it would, be, it would happen at the meeting here in Dublin next month. Uh, but clearly, uh, there are quite a, a long way to go on that, uh, Deputy uh, Higgins. The Troika have to do their an analysis of the detail of how this would work, the uh, different loans, the maturities, uh, when they're due, and so on like that. And this would have to be adopted by each, uh, by each country. Um, you asked me about the, what is the benefit of extending maturities. Well, it's, it is potentially very significant, and it will be beneficial for Ireland, as it will reduce the amount that the NTMA will need to re refinance on the debt markets in, the, in those years in which the loans were originally due to be repaid. And I speak now in respect of the, um, of the extension already agreed here. And in addition, the cost of such uh, term loans from the EFSF and from the EFSM is likely to be lower than Ireland would have to pay in the debt markets given the superior credit rating of these institutions of Europe in the coming years. It will be cheaper for us to uh, hold on to that. This is particularly important as there are significant amounts of existing non-EU IMF debt maturing from 2015 to 2020, and accordingly an extension of those maturities would be viewed very positively by the debt markets and would therefore benefit Ireland's overall uh, cost of borrowing. That decision, if you like, serves as a, an example of the progress that the government has made and is making at European level in reducing the cost of the EU IMF programme <coughs> entered into by, by the previous administration. Um, so the, some of the, the issues, obviously, that have happened here are the replacement of the promissory notes and the liquidation of IBRC, um, the, the 29th of June uh, agreement and the specific reference to improving the sustainability of the programme here. Um, so those are, those are issues that are relevant to us uh, and won't have to repay a principal on promissory notes in 2038, which gives, us, which gives us a real opportunity to get our house in order, uh, to have our economy well run, to have a prosperous country where we can really um, um, focus on the question and the challenge of creating jobs. And I, I might just say this, I listened to um, President Clinton when he was here two years ago, and he made this point, that every country that goes through a recession, that when it's over, that the tradition or the, 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 the historical fact, historic fact has been that it takes at least 10 years to make that benefit filter down to, to people on the ground in, in the context of creating jobs. And he said the challenge for Ireland is to short circuit that and prove that you can actually uh, import or have real benefit from exiting a programme, restoring your public finances and getting your economy back to good health. But, but uh, to focus on the creation of jobs and not to have, as they call it, a jobless recovery. And I think that's a challenge that this House here and this Oireachtas have a lot of ideas about. All I can say is that from a government's perspective, we are willing to act in the interest of getting people off the live register, of making decisions that will increase flexibility and access to credit for small businesses so that jobs can be created, and to keep the strong elements of what we've got both Enterprise Ireland in terms of exports and jobs being created here and in other countries with profits accruing to Ireland, and also in respect of the continued line of very strong foreign direct investment in here, further evidence of which is there today. This actually, Deputy Higgins, is the really big challenge for the country. Sort out our public finances, put our, put our uh, economy in a place where, it start, where it's growing and becoming prosperous, but that it does so with a direct impact beneficially on the creation of jobs. So the extension of maturity dates would be of benefit to us in terms of the cost of our borrowing and the uh, sustainability of our capacity to repay. 
and give us the opportunity to make decisions to grow our job numbers and give our people hope and confidence and real uh, benefits uh, by short-circuiting uh, what happened in other countries on a regular basis. So that's where our focus is uh, over the next period, to see how we can really impact on creating jobs and getting people off the live register. And the Minister for Social Protection has a, a huge uh, structural change taking place in social protection uh, to, give, uh, to give effect to that. Taoiseach, just really following on from the last question and your response to it, do you not realise that ordinary people in this country are really sick at this stage of hearing constant announcements about progress on restoring the public finances of the state and announcements as we've had over the last number of weeks about great deals uh, for stringing out the length of period over which we have to pay these enormous debts back and having those things declared as victories and reasons to celebrate when <coughs> uh, absolutely nothing is committed to in terms of alleviating the burden of cuts and austerity that are being demanded of those citizens this year, next year, and the year after. And, you know, isn't the truth of it, isn't the truth of this issue, Taoiseach, that extending out maturities makes no difference to the fact that we are going to pay out this year eight, over eight billion euro in interest on this massive debt which you will not even ask for a write down on. And we will continue to pay that enormous level of interest on this utterly unsustainable debt year on year for years to come. And that it is that, that huge, the same level almost as much as the education budget, which is being paid out on interest on a debt that is largely either not ours at all or not the responsibility of ordinary citizens in that it resulted from a collapse engineered by others. And that that's the problem, and unless you address that, we are going to be bled dry. And when you rightly say we're facing into, or as you uh, suggest, we are facing into a decade, a decade of this misery, of bumping along the bottom with mass unemployment, no or negligible uh, growth, uh, and that there's no prospect of that situation being improved if we continue to have this money drained out of us year on year. And can I ask you, in your discussions with uh, other European leaders, and indeed in your statements about likely improvements in our uh, financial situation, why is it you don't admit when you say we're going to meet the 3% target and that that will be the end of it? if you like, we'll be out of the worst. Why don't you admit that that's not going to be the case? Because when we get out, when we reach the 3% target, we immediately come under the demands of the fiscal referendum. And even though there is a three-year time gap, we will be required under that treaty to move towards 0.5%. And we will be required to, on a 120th of the death per year basis, reduced by half this debt of 200 billion euro, requiring billions of extra cuts and austerity, even after we meet the 3% debt target. So we are facing into a decade of further cuts to pay off these debts and to meet the deficit targets. So where's the relief? Where's the relief, Taoiseach? When, where is the light on the horizon? for ordinary people, given those requirements that you have signed up to and committed to. And lastly, Taoiseach, I don't think you should be uh, light-hearted, frankly, about the issue of the wine bill. Uh, can you explain the wine bill that has been uh, built up under uh, your government in the Department of Foreign Affairs? Why? has that wine bill, for the year that you came into office, quadrupled. I repeat, the amount expended 
by the Tornishes Department in the year that you came into office quadrupled. We, ne we now, it appears, need four times more wine than we needed in the last year of the previous government to entertain the great and the good of Europe. Is our strategy to, I don't know, get them a bit tipsy in the hope that they'll give us, uh, give us the break that we haven't succeeded in getting off them uh, in terms of our debt? It's simply unconscious unconscionable, faced with the level of austerity being, uh, being inflicted on ordinary people, that we have to spend four times more on wining and dining uh, delegates from Europe. Maybe it might be better if deputies were to take questions of that nature to the individual, might be helpful, yeah, to can the individual minister so you get a proper answer because, you know, we're left here with, you know, Taoiseach's questions have become a comprehensive debating uh, chamber and those who have genuine questions down aren't getting the answers. So, you know, could we maybe stick to the questions that have been tabled and we might get answers to them? Our supplementaries from those questions. Tisha. Um, Ken Cole, I'm, I'm quite sure that Deputy Barrett doesn't want the whatever, whatever meagre shelves they have in the Department of Foreign Affairs to be to be stocked with uh, blue nun or black tower for the people who arrive in from uh, from foreign countries. And maybe you do. I don't know. Uh, if we could have somebody who could who could you know transform the water into wine, they'd be very welcome, I, I'm, I'm quite sure as well. But I don't agree with you at all about this decade of misery. The point I made to you, Deputy Boyd Barrow, was that what President Clinton said, the challenge for Ireland was to short circuit what's happened in most other places. And he said, you have the capacity to do this because the big decisions that are made in terms of our programme, of exiting the programme, of uh, improving our debt sustainability, of having cash flow uh, because of the decisions made to extend the maturities of the promissory notes and hopefully the discussions arising in respect of other loans uh, will give us that breathing space and that's why government are actually focusing on the decisions now for investment and changes of structures that will allow for a much more immediate impact for those people whom I represent and who you represent who are on the live register who want, who want to be employed, who want to contribute, who want to work, uh, and who at the moment, for one reason or another, might not find that very, uh, might not find a great degree of confidence about their finding a job. And yet the whole structure that's being changed by the Minister for Social Protection <coughs> in the way that the intro offices are now dealing with people on the live register is fundamentally different than what applied in the past. As you're aware, um, the IMF EU programme was, uh, was 85 billion. That's, um, that's what we inherited just two years ago, uh, two years ago this week. Uh, and the, the programme for government uh, set out very clearly to make decisions to deal with the, that public financial problem, to change the structures of the way uh, that we make decisions and do business in the country. And that 85 billion was made up of 17 and a half from our own resources. They were cash reserves in the, in the National Pension Reserve Fund. 22.5 billion from the IMF extended loan facility. 22.5 billion from the EFSM or the European Financial Stabilization Mechanism. 22.5 billion from the European Financial Stability Facility or the EFSF. 17.5, um, 17.7 billion and bilateral loans from the United Kingdom. Uh, 3.8 billion from them, uh, 0.6 billion from Sweden, and Denmark 0.4 billion. So those two, the EFSF and the EFSM, obviously it's in our interest because they're borrowed at lower rates than you get on the markets uh, to be able to extend that to give us that capacity to have cash flow to deal with uh, investment in business and therefore the creation uh, of profit for for the country and for the economy. Um, the EFSF accounts for just under 18 billion of programme funding and to date Ireland has availed of almost 13 billion of that in six tranches with original maturities ranging from 3.1 years to 29 years and that's what the Troika will examine in the, in the case of the loans, the specific loans, the rates, the, the rates of those loans and the dates of maturity. The FSM accounts for 22.5 billion of the programme and we've availed of 21.7 billion of that in nine tranches with original maturities ranging from five years to 30 years.
So while you mightn't think it, the vast majority of the, original, uh, of the external funds borrowed were used for the provision of public services like health and education and social protection services. And most of the funds were used to recapitalise recapitalize the banks have come from the NPRF. So what's been, what's been borrowed from abroad under those, from those institutional funds was for our people, for education, for health, for social protection services, and I'm sure, and wages, and I'm sure that even you I wouldn't want that not to have happened. So 3.6 billion net of the EFSF loans will fall to be repaid within the next three years, uh, with an additional 5 billion of EFSM debt maturing. And this obviously places a pressure on the state um, through, uh, through the NTMA, along with existing uh, debt maturities, uh, to borrow this money on the debt markets at that time. So that's the reason why, uh, in respect of um, these matters, we're hopeful of, uh, of, of further progress. So I don't accept at all your, your, um, your assertion uh, that just because it happened to others uh, that we're condemned here, as you say, to bobbing along the bottom in a decade of misery. Yes, these are challenging times. And they're challenging for everybody, Deputy Boyd Barrett. But it's not going to get better unless government work with its colleagues in Europe and unless government make its decisions here in the interests of all our people. And that's why these public pay talks are so important, that everybody from the highest uh, to the latest recruit put their shoulder to the wheel and make their contribution. And those contributions in many cases are challenging and are difficult and are very hard to make. But it, it is in the interest of our country, sorting it out and the generation coming behind us. Um, and insofar as the decisions of government are concerned, that to be as fair as is possible across the board. But don't accept your assertion of, uh, of being confined uh, to a decade uh, of, of, uh, of what you have described earlier Deputy on. Deputy Adams. Thank you, yeah. uh, Chair, it was my intention to ask you an entirely different supplementary but you didn't answer my question. You, you talked at length in response to my supplementary about Syria. And I have to say I share your concerns and I agree with a lot of what you had to say. But my question wasn't about Syria. It was about the recently produced uh, report by the heads of mission, the Jerusalem report. Now, the, the presidency, the state's presidency of the EU and your government's presidency of the EU will last six months, as I understand it. And, and that will quickly pass. So if you wanted to reflect back after that period on what big thing you had done, no better thing than to have taken the heads of mission report produced by EU heads of mission for the EU and ensured that that is on the clear for the summits and the discussions that you are involved in. And I think further, you know, to deal with the recommendations, which are very, very clear and which are entirely within the uh, remit of the EU, would, would assist uh, terrifically in trying to bring some sense to what's happening in the Middle East, because the situation there, without very, very significant international intervention, can only get worse. And I'm, I'm no prophet of doom. I'm from the optimistic wing of uh, politics, but it is for certain the situation will only get worse. And you have visited uh, that uh, region. I have been there quite a few times, including in Gaza, and I always come away with a, a sadness, because what is lacking is leadership. And what we need is therefore is people from outside that uh, particular block to come in and to, to take lateral action. So here you have it, you know, the balls at your toe. EU heads of mission have produced a report with very specific recommendations that you under your presidency can, I would like to think, act on, but at least can certainly ensure that they are uh, discussed. And then on the issue, like four and a half thousand prisoners and a, and a prisoner uh, dead in custody, uh, and the allegation that he was actually tortured and two children uh, killed. So, Taoiseach, I would just commend those issues uh, 
to you, you know, maybe the fundamental question is, does the Irish presidency have a role in these matters? And, you know, I would like to think, given our history, that, that you would see this as your very definitive uh, historical role to use your presidency to focus on peace in the Middle East, and particularly, as I've said a few times, on a report that has been brought forward for your attention. The other question I just mentioned it, uh, very, very briefly is if you would lay it, whatever of anything has been achieved on the issue of the retrospective bank recapitulation at this uh, week's uh, ACOFIN and Eurogroup meetings, because you will, you will recall way back in June that there was a, a commitment to separate banking debt from sovereign debt, and the government interpreted that as being retrospective. I think there was something, is it 28 billion has been put in by the, the former Fianna Fáil government and uh, your government. So just uh, if you could give us some clarity or clarify where that uh, situation is at the moment. But Thank you. Uh, the big question I put to you again is to act on the Jerusalem report, Tisha. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Deputy is aware that the, um, the presidency of the country doesn't actually um, doesn't actually uh, drive individual issues here. In the case of um, in the case of the Middle East, this is on the agenda constantly, both for the European Council um, and for uh, and for whatever presidency is involved in in the rotation. But it is the it is the High Representative, Catherine Ashton, who makes the report both to the uh, Council. Um, and um, uh, at whatever other meetings of the Minister for Foreign Affairs apply. And Thonis has been uh, in attendance at a number of these. But it is true to say, Deputy Adams, that the, the Presidency uh, does have, obviously, a very close working relationship with the heads of government and, as a consequence, with the High Representative. So from that point of view, um, you can take it that the Thonis has already uh, been involved in this insofar as, insofar as the council meetings are concerned, uh, it's on the agenda and I, I will be happy to raise this at the next council uh, heads of government meeting myself as presidency and as a member of the council. Um, I will do that, Deputy Adams. In respect of the um, decision of last year, well, the, the the Minister for Finance did make recommendations for the architecture of the single supervisory mechanism, and those discussions started in the new year, now under the chairmanship, uh, now under the chairmanship of the Dutch Minister for, for Finance at the, uh, at the Euro Group, and at ECOFIN by Minister, by Minister Noonan. Um, and as you're aware, uh, this morning, this very morning, uh, they, made their, uh, they made further uh, progress in regard to principles that have been agreed. Uh, but obviously not delivered upon yet because of the requirement for Troika and for each of the individual countries to accept that, uh, if that be so. We would hope that it would be Minister Noonan's working on that. But also the discussions uh, are on in respect of the single supervisory mechanism uh, leading to banking union, which would be um, in probably in, 20, in 2014. Um, I don't expect that that will be concluded before then. Some of these things are very complex, given the, the range of uh, banks to be covered and the issues that are involved in that. And clearly the, um, the Credit Resolution Directive, which, uh, which was debated this morning on the basis of an Irish proposition, uh, will be something that will be, um, have to be delivered on by enhanced, um, enhanced majority, if that be so. Uh, but that's an issue that affects... Um, affects the entire, um, the entire European area as well. Deputy Martin. Uh, Tishuk, I, I asked earlier in relation to the ECB um, profits that it's making on holding of Irish bonds, and you read from a, a lengthy document, and would have, could have first of all asked if you could um, forward that document uh, to me, the, the document you read from there in relation to the ECB. Can you send a copy over to us? God, you're, very, you're very helpful. That's <laughs> energy, of course. <laughs> That's what, what, but the point I would make in relation to the answer, uh, Taoiseach, is this. Um, you didn't answer the question that I asked, which was basically, have you formally asked 
for ECB profits on Irish bonds to be returned to Ireland or not. Um, and I would put it to you, Taoiseach, that if a deal is done for Greece, um, the same should apply to Portugal, Ireland uh, and others in, 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 in programmes. Uh, because that has been the principle from the outset of this crisis, that uh, what's um, provided for in one country is provided for in another, uh, as we had originally with the reduction in the interest rates. Um, so I don't think you've quite answered the question um, in terms of, uh, given what happened to Greece in that context, uh, why shouldn't it happen for Ireland and indeed Portugal as well? And have we asked? Have we put it on the table? Uh, so you might indicate to me whether you, you have or not uh, put it on the table. And secondly, why haven't we, um, why haven't we commissioned a study on the economic impact of a potential British exit uh, from the European Union? Do we know what the impact would be on, our, on the Irish economy? And it seems to illustrate a lack of proactivity in terms of future planning in relation to the European Union. I've made this point on numerous occasions in this House, Teacher. I put it to you. What is our overall position in terms of the future of the Union? Uh, what's our understanding of a fiscal Europe, or fiscal federal Europe, for example? Do we agree with that? Um, what are the various scenarios that will arise from the Van Rompuy um, analysis? Uh, the treaty change that may come down the tracks, are, 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 sorry, are we just kind of hanging around waiting to see what emerges and then uh, making quick decisions based on that? So I would ask you, Tishik, why haven't we um, commissioned a report which would specifically quantify the impact um, on our economy if Britain was to withdraw from the European Union? And will you now, in this House, commit to the government undertaking such um, a study, which I think would be important? given that we are dealing with the largest trading partner of Ireland within the, the European Union um, itself. Thank you. The figures are well known of the scale of uh, trade between Ireland and Britain on a daily basis over and back across the Irish Sea. Um, 2017 is a very long way away in terms of, uh, in terms of politics and in terms of, in terms of uh, the views that might be expressed by the British government and by the British people. Uh, and clearly, the general election in Britain will take place in the in the, in, in, in the interim. So, uh, I mean, you know, you're asking you're asking now for an analysis to be carried out uh, in something that's uh, that's four or five years away, depending on what the, the we have all the figures. We have all the figures as to what the trade now is. And if you, yes, you do. Sorry, so sorry. Please, you have please, them on please. a daily basis. Chair, we know what they are across the, over and back across the sea. Uh, every day, we, we have all of that. And if you want a mountain of that material, we, we, I'll give it to you. Now, you're asking, you asked me specific detail about work that's in progress here for quite some time. Like, you know, you're coming from a base yourself of where you said this could never happen, that it would never, it would never become a reality. That you'd you'd never you'd never get you'd never deal with promissory notes. That you'd never be that you'd be constantly having to borrow 3.1 billion every year. That you wouldn't have a breach between sovereign debt and bank debt. These are these are issues that you have raised, oh, and you talk about being proactive. You talk about being, about being proactive. And, I, mean, I mean, Deputy Martin, for, for you to come with that line of talk is simply absurd. But, but you do it on a regular basis, as if people haven't forgotten what happened in the past. Now, I, I, want, you to, I want you to understand this, that we have set out a very clear strategy and a plan here to reduce, our, to reduce the cost of borrowing and to enhance our debt sustainability. Now, with the question that you asked, is work that is in progress, I've pointed out to you in the lengthy document that you say that we are very different than our colleagues in Greece, and we've made that position clearly, uh, and the heads of government were very specific that Greece was a very specific case here. And the question that you ask is work in progress. Have we got another supplementary, Deb? Well, yeah, I'll just ask the question uh, again. Have then, you relative to the questions that are yes. on the order paper, yeah, I have, I have 11. I've listened to all afternoon so here, and we're oh, answering sorry. questions that aren't even on the order paper. But I've, I've but we stick to the order paper. Yeah, I, I've tabled it. Get replies. John, but I've tabled 11 questions. Yeah, but listen, My you want me to read out to you what the questions I've read are? I've them. I know what they are. But and there's I, nothing to do with what no, you're it speaking does. about. It actually does. He's met with every European leader. He's met with Barossa. Of course it does. And I've been very brief, to be fair. 
I've only been in know, twice on, for a very again, short period. Please. The Taoiseach, Philip Busters, this question time, but, Cian Corla, no, but time was, and time again. We're once the, from what's once on the, the Taoiseach gets to his feet here, it's 15 or 20 minutes an answer. So it's, this isn't the one-way street. Yeah, well, yeah. We're not even, when we ask a question, there, we don't get answers to them. No, we're all strained, Deputy. Would you please? The I asked a very up. brief question. Time Have you formally asked for the ECB profits on Irish bonds to be returned to Ireland? Not. Have we asked the ECB for that? Yes or no? Oh, you, you are well aware now that the European Central Bank is an entirely independent uh, operation. Our representative on that European Central Bank is Governor of the Irish Central Bank, Patrick Honan, who is working diligently and relentlessly in the nation's interest. And the question that you ask and the, the issue of the best return uh, for Ireland and for Ireland's taxpayers is a focus of government and is work that is ongoing on a, on a, on a, on a constant basis. Deputy Higgins. Taoiseach, you reference President Clinton with regard to uh, policies he advocates to short-circuit the process of recovery, as he put it. Can I, just in passing, caution you in regard to taking President Clinton Sorry, as time is steady a, up, would you put your supplementary next here. He presided over the disastrous deregulation in banking that gave us the, the, the crisis in the first place. Um, can I ask you, in relation to... Uh, the surveillance of EU budgets, the two-pack, the six-pack, and has this been discussed or is it to be discussed in the course of the presidency? Because this is a whole new process, providing for very strict surveillance and new powers to the EU Commission to dictate aspects of the budgets of member states and insist on ongoing and continual austerity. Have you discussed that or is it on the agenda of the presidency as to how this will uh, be implemented in the course of this year of 2013 and what are the implications Thank you for uh, the, the a demand for further austerity in the on the Irish economy Deputy Boyd Barris, could you put your supplementary please? Time is up. Uh, thanks, uh, Karen Corlett. Uh, Taoiseach um, First of all, is, is it not uh, a bit disingenuous to uh, refer to the recapitalisation of the banks as coming out of the National Pension Reserve Fund, when of course that was part of an overall package where we were forced to uh, hand over Question. the funds for a rainy day for this state and for its citizens as a condition for getting loans, all of which were to pay back the gambling debts of private financial institutions, our own banks, uh, or to protect uh, the banks in Europe. So that's not really an answer to the substantial question I asked you, which is about the debt mountain of 200 billion on which we are having to pay interest, which is draining the lifeblood out of the economy and taking from us the funds that we could use to invest in job Thank creation you. and growth. And wh why is it you will not address this issue with these EU leaders? Thank you. Nisha. Well, uh, in respect to the two-pack that Deputy Higgins mentioned, this actually was, uh, was the focus of, uh, of an element of our presidency here. Uh, and I was very happy to welcome last month's um, agreement on that, which was brokered, in fact, by the Irish presidency, together with the European Parliament and the European Commission. It is uh, an important part of the Eurozone's uh, economic architecture. Uh, it means that the new rules will improve budgetary, and economic coordination among Eurozone countries. Uh, they will ensure that we have full knowledge on developments across the Eurozone and assist in preventing future crises that might arise. The agreement will now have to be approved by the Council and the Parliament before becoming law. And for programme countries, enhanced EU surveillance will remain in place until the balance of EU loans outstanding falls below 25% of the total. And there are still a number of precise details to be worked out, Deputy Higgins. The impact of it here, uh, as was um, referred to uh, on a number of occasions, will mean an earlier budget uh, than the date that uh, the, the last budget appeared on, and the details of that will emerge uh, in, in due course. Um, for um, Deputy Boyd Barrett, I have to repeat again that the monies that were borrowed were for wages, for salaries, for social protection services, for educational services, 
uh, and for health services. And if you want to ask uh, questions about the NPRF, well, maybe you might address that to Deputy Martin when you get a chance. Thank you. That completes the Shulk's questions for today. Uh, we now move on to the uh, order of business when you're ready, Tisha. <coughs> The order of business should be as follows. Number 813, motion regarding by-election for Mead East to be taken on the conclusion of the order of business. Number 13, Finance Bill 2013, allocation of time motion for select subcommittee. Number 14, Finance Bill 2013, financial resolutions. Number 15, Finance Local Property Tax Amendment Bill 2013, financial resolution. Number 16, motion regarding proposed approval by the all in the section 17A of the Diseases of Animals Act 1966 shall continue in force for the period ending on the 8th of March 2014, back from committee. Number 27, Finance Local Property Tax Amendment Bill 2013, committee in remaining stages. It is proposed, notwithstanding anything standing orders, that 1, the Dáil shall sit later than 9pm tonight and shall adjourn not later than 10.30pm. 2, the proceedings in relation to number 813 shall, if not previously concluded, be brought to a conclusion after 25 minutes and the following arrangements shall apply. One, the speeches uh, shall be made by the Taoiseach Thánaiste and the leaders of Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin and a representative of the technical group or a person nominated in their stead and such members may share their time. Numbers 13, 14, 15 and 16 shall be decided without debate and in the case of number 14, the financial resolutions number 1 to 42 shall be moved together and decided by one question which shall be put from the chair. Number 4, the committee in remaining stages of number 27 shall be taken today and the proceedings thereon shall, if not previously concluded, be brought to a conclusion at 10.30 p.m. tonight by one question, which shall be put from the Chair and which shall, in relation to amendments, include only those set down or accepted by the Minister for Finance. And number five, in the event a division is in progress at the time fixed for taking private members' business, which shall be number 97, which is a motion on Health Insurance Standing Order 121.3, shall not apply, and the private members' business shall, if not previously concluded, adjourn after 90 minutes. Uh, there are uh, five proposals to be put to the House. Number one is the proposal that the Dáil shall sit later than 9 p.m. tonight. Agreed to? No, not agreed. Not agreed. Not agreed. Uh, Deputy Martin. Uh, Corley, the, the, the programme for government um, included a commitment that to tackle the huge overuse of guillotines to ram through non-emergency legislation. And what we have essentially today in the order and in the very first in it is an attempt to do just that um, in the context of uh, the property tax amendment bill. Uh, now, Taoiseach, there are 67 amendments tabled to the property tax bill tonight. However, only two and a half hours um, has been allocated for the entire um, committee stage. There is no emergency here. That's about three minutes um, per amendment. So the vast majority of the House will be, um, sorry, the vast majority of the bill will not be debated. Uh, because the government is guillotining this debate unnecessarily, as it actually did with the original bill before Christmas, uh, with only three of the 88 amendments uh, were discussed before Christmas. Only three out of 88. Um, now, the government has had to bring forward a property amendment tax bill uh, because uh, of the rushed nature uh, of the bill before Christmas. On this side of the House, we are putting forward a whole range of am amendments to provide exemptions or relief for the following categories, notwithstanding we believe this is the wrong tax at the wrong time. For example, we want to put on an amendment that households in mortgage arrears would be um, exempt. I can't understand how people who can't pay their Sorry, mortgage we can't have a debate pay the on the actual issue. We have an amendment down in terms of negative equity, that they would be exempt in conformity with the Commission on Taxation. We have an amendment down in relation to households yeah, in receipt of certain social protection payments and pensioners. We have an amendment down in terms of people who've paid large amounts of stamp duty over the last um, 10 years. And we have amendments down in terms of low-income households. Now, we're not going to get an opportunity to table those amendments. The same thing happened with the Social Welfare Thanks, Bill Deputy. and with the Property Tax Bill uh, before Christmas. And now it's going to happen again. The government is ramming this through, showing scant regard for Parliament, uh, for the Doyle, uh, and indeed for the people, who actually would like if members in the House had an opportunity uh, to give full vent to these issues and to amendment by amendment have adequate time um, to put arguments and counter arguments before the House. Thank you. But the government is showing no regard for that. It just wants to ram this through um, as fast as it possibly can, um, regardless of any commitments it made in the programme for government. Deputy Adams. Uh, 
I also want to oppose Proposal 1. There are 67 amendments down to this bill. So that allows for less than two minutes for every amendment, and we know we won't get to the vast majority of the amendments. So the families who are not able to afford this, and there's a whole range of uh, people who, who can't afford it, people in uh, mortgage distress most particularly, uh, where we want to be able to debate and argue and to discuss these matters out. So I think, I think the government is just tearing up all of those flowery words that it used and talked about reforming politics and how the Arctis works and the uh, people's revolution. Why not allow Taoiseach these issues to be fully debated out? Thank you. Deputy Boyd Barrett. Taoiseach, you're making a mockery of this House and of the democratic process in the way you are guillotining through these bills. Uh, as I said to you last week, there is now an absolutely clear, deliberate and cynical policy on your part that where a bill is not controversial and has all, all uh, party support, you let it run on for days or weeks. But if the bill is controversial, particularly if it inflicts further suffering on ordinary families in this country, on working people, on the unemployed, on vulnerable sectors of our society, you try and ram it through without adequate time for debate, for scrutiny or for amendments. Uh, you are allowing just over two minutes for amendments, for 67 amendments uh, tonight. That is utterly unacceptable. You did exactly the same prior to Christmas where only three of 88 amendments were taken. It is absolutely uh, undermining and eroding the democratic process in the most cynical way. And you smile over there like Cheshire cats when you're doing it because you think it is funny. But uh, undermining the demo democratic process is not funny. It's bad enough that you're doing this to the citizens of this country, but to, to refuse to allow proper debate and scrutiny of this legislation by the public and the doll is outrageous beyond belief. Thank you. So what are you going to do, Taoiseach? Are you going to honour the words in your uh, programme for government of a democratic revolution? Or are you going to shred democracy in order to impose the diktats of the Troika? Thank you. Taoiseach to reply. Well, Deputy Boyd Barrett, uh, on Thursday uh, created consternation in here and you refused to accept two hours extra for Friday to have the debate continue until half past five from half ten in the morning sorry, sorry, until sorry. half past three. You were offered two extra hours so that the nation could listen to your glorious incantations and you sorry, turned you it please? down. Now it's, it's well known as been signalled for a very long time the revenue commissioners who, are, uh, who will implement the mechanics of, of uh, the implementation and collection of the property tax. Uh, we, we want to send out their, their, um, their uh, notices to liable persons next week. Uh, so that's the reason why we want this put through, uh, dealt with all day today and in the Shannon uh, tomorrow. You're aware that there are elements in here that are very important for people about pirate affected homes, deferral for personal representatives, um, and a whole range of other deferrals and exemptions, relief for disabled persons, local adjustment factors, sale of property between liability and payment dates, de deliberate under declaration of chargeable value, uh, liable person definitions in approved housing bodies and local authorities, and a number of uh, technical amendments that are required. So it's time to move on, Deputy <coughs> Boyd Barrett. You had your rant on Thursday. You refused two hours <coughs> extra debate. Um, you want to move this on and deal with it, and uh, we'll have your say. Thank you. I'm now putting the question. I'm now putting the question. It's not a rant, T-shirt. Sorry. 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 See, Deputy. You say these things are about it to be walking now. If you don't listen to me, you'll be walking. You hear me? I'm issuing a last warning to you. I'm issuing a last warning to you. You are absolutely a democratic process. I'm suspending the city of the house for five minutes. Thank you.